Good morning. I'm Ron Gifford. I'm really excited to be here today because so much of uh, our work has been informed by organizations represented in this room. I'm really curious to find out if you think we're on the right track or not. So, Jump In for Healthy Kids is a multi-sector initiative. It's focused on childhood obesity in the Indianapolis metro area. The business community played a seminal role in the development of our initiative. The CEOs of our leading companies and healthcare institutions actually created Jump In. So when we talk about business engagement in this initiative, it started at the very beginning. I want to give you a little bit of background as to how that came to be and then talk about some of the specific ways we're attempting to engage the business community in this initiative. So in 2008, the American College of Sports Medicine, which is headquartered in Indianapolis and led by Jim Whitehead, uh, published the first American Fitness Index. And if you're familiar with the AFI, it's a snapshot of the state of health and well-being on the 50 largest metros in the United States. Indianapolis ranked 34th in that first report. Not great when you're a city that aspires to compete against Nashville, Charlotte, Austin, and other places for jobs, talent, and investment. Well, by 2011, we had fallen to 45th, 11 spots. And if the prior rankings had generated some general discussion, this move prompted a very serious sense of urgency. The publisher of the Indianapolis Star invited a group of civic and business leaders to talk about what could be done collectively to improve the health of our community. And from those discussions, a core group convened in the fall of 2012, led by the CEOs of our largest companies, healthcare systems, and foundations. The members of that group included Dr. John Lechleiter, the CEO of Lilly, Jack Phillips, the CEO of Roche, Diagnostics, Rob Hillman, the president of Anthem, Indiana, the CEOs of our five major healthcare institutions, the publisher of the Star, the head of the Lilly Endowment, and the leaders of major civic and business institutions um, in the community. They met several times over the course of a year, worked with some consultants, and decided to focus their efforts on child obesity for several reasons. First, obesity was one of the top health issues identified in the community health needs assessments that our hospital systems did in 2012. Secondly, at, during the same time frame, but independent of these conversations, Lilly, Roche, the State of Indiana, the Lilly Endowment, the Indiana University School of Medicine were all working on a partnership to create the Indiana Biosciences Research Institute, a, an independent research organization that would focus, uh, at least in part, on systems biology related to diabetes, obesity, and other related metabolic diseases. And so there seemed to be a great opportunity to align a public health initiative with the research uh, institution focusing on the uh, health related to those other issues. And then finally, as I mentioned, the success stories that were being reported in this time period by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the CDC, and others, looking at the work in other communities that had begun to move the needle, bend the bend the trend line on child obesity, if you will. And those efforts seem to suggest a template for what we might do in our community. So based on that, this CEO group agreed to create and fund a multi-year initiative targeting child obesity. And Jump In formally launched in 2014 as the backbone organization for this initiative. So as a first step, we created a 40-person community-wide leadership council, co-chaired by Jack Phillips, the CEO of Roche, representing the private sector, and Dr. Virginia Kane, the Marion County Indianapolis Public Health Director, so that we brought public health to the table as well. The Leadership Council included all of our founding organizations and many of the CEOs themselves, but we broadened it to include representation from the nonprofit, academic, civic, and government sectors. So our members include the Dean of the Indiana University Fairbanks School of Public Health, the State Health Commissioner, the Mayor of Indianapolis, the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, which runs our State Department of Education, Jim Whitehead on behalf of ACSM, and we also brought to the table other business representation. So the President of our State Chamber of Commerce, for example, um, the leadership of our uh, professional sports teams, uh, all of our healthcare institutions. So in 2014 and early in 2015, 
We engaged more than 85 businesses and civic organizations in several task forces. We wanted to understand what strategies were already being implemented in the community, identify gaps and barriers that were existing. We looked at best practices around the country, as I mentioned, including much of the work done by organizations in this room. We developed a comprehensive set of interventions around nutrition and physical activity, and then prioritized them based on a feasibility and impact analysis. And then in May of 2015, we spent two days at the CDC um, vetting these strategies, meeting with the subject matter experts there, understanding if we were on the right track, and then asking for their guidance on how best to implement these programs in our community. We also established in this process, we also established a long-term goal for the initiative. That is a 12% reduction in the obesity prevalence rate over 10 years. Now, a little side note, this is the interesting thing about having the business sector and the public health community at the same table. When we first recommended this goal to our leadership council, many of the business leaders wanted to know why we had set such a low goal. And many of our public health professionals thought we were out of our mind. <laughs> so it's an interesting world that uh, we operate in. We began to implement these strategies last fall. I'd like to give you a quick overview of these initiatives and then again focus a little bit more specifically on um, business engagement. Uh, without putting up the graph, this is really based on the social ecological model is what we're trying to, 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 to address here. So our first strategy is to create healthy environments in those settings that most directly influence children's behavior with a particular focus on schools, child care providers, and youth serving organizations like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs, and the like. Our goal is to incorporate these four policies into those environments in every setting that impacts a child. So if you feed kids, make sure you're feeding them healthy meals, snacks, and beverages. Make sure they're physically active when they're in your care. Teach them about these habits so that when they're not with you, they can incorporate them into their behaviors. And finally, be a good role model. Don't kill, don't, don't tell, don't kill kids either. Don't. <laughs> that should be good advice for everybody, any initiative. <laughs> don't tell the kids to drink water while you're having a Slurpee, right? We're doing this in our community through a, a campaign that we call Make the Leap. It asks organizations to make the leap, jump in to pledge to be good role models to do their part to promote these policies within um, the, uh, these organizations. We've created a step-by-step -step process to make it easy as possible with resources tailored for each sector so that these policies can be embedded and implemented into these settings. And as it relates to schools, our pledge and the elements of the pledge are very much aligned with the CDC's school health index. For our child care, it's very much aligned with training programs that have been developed by Nemours and other organizations like that. So we've tried to uh, t attach these to best practices. Our second strategy is to target discrete geographic areas within our broader community so that we can focus with the players in that community on systemic issues. So not only incorporating into the specific schools, child care providers, employers, and the like, not only to work on the policies I identified a moment ago, but to start to address in those communities issues like access to affordable, healthy foods, um, dealing with infrastructure issues, creating safe places for kids to play, creating safe ways for kids to get to places to play. Um, in our first community, uh, the Lawrence Township, it's in the northeastern part of Indianapolis. It is a community that has significant health disparities. Most of the public schools in that part of the township have 85 to 90 percent uh, free and reduced lunch population. Uh, most of that township qualifies as a USDA certified food <clears throat> desert. Later this month, a brand new Boys and Girls Club is going to open in that community. It's a wonderful resource that'll be there. Across an eight-lane thoroughfare uh, in our community are several apartment complexes where a lot of kids live. A real example of how to bring the community together to deal with access issues is how do we create a safe environment at the intersection for the kids who live in the apartment complexes to get to the Boys and Girls Club. And oh, by the way, they have to walk past a strip club to get across the street. This is an issue that the Boys and Girls Club cannot solve on its own, but by bringing all of the key players in that community 
from local government, employers, uh, the nonprofit sector, et cetera, we think that we can really focus attention on those kinds of systemic issues. And then our final strategy is the broader notion of changing the social conversation, changing social norms. It focuses on public awareness. We've adopted the 5210 program from Let's Go Maine. It's a wonderful resource and an easy way to talk about nutrition in the community. We're working with partners throughout the community on public policy issues like complete streets and safe routes to school. Now, when we talk about businesses specifically, we look at three areas of engagement that a business can have, or three spheres of influence, if you will. What happens at the work site with employees is that first strategy. So our employer pledge <coughs> focuses on what happens at the work site with the adoption of healthy meeting strategies, other policies relating to physical activity, healthy vending, and things like that. So we create an environment at the work site that makes it easier for employees to engage in healthy behaviors. From there, we, we also hope that these policies get incorporated into employer wellness programs, but we're cognizant of the fact that all employers don't have those programs, specifically the smaller mid-size employers, and we heard about that in the presentation this morning. So one of the strategies we've developed is an employer wellness coaching program. So the wellness directors of 10 of our largest companies have agreed to serve as coaches, and we're going to identify 10 small to mid-sized employers that either don't have wellness policies or are having difficulty implementing those policies, and we're going to connect them for one-on-one -on -one coaching in a defined period over a six-month period of time with the idea that this program, as it begins to spread, we can get more coaches, um, connect with more companies, as those companies that have received the coaching begin to implement these policies themselves, they in turn can become coaches to peer uh, businesses within the community as well. When we talk about connecting with families, what happens with families and dependents outside the work site, part of that is simply reinforcing these healthy behaviors at home. So we've developed a toolkit full of a social message, a social media posts, uh, articles for the com company newsletter and the like, so that the company can very easily cut and paste these messages into the communications that go to family members in this process. And then finally, this third sphere is the company's influence in the community. Regardless of size, companies tend to be involved in their community, whether it's the immediate neighborhood or the broader community, in a couple of ways, through philanthropic or sponsorship roles and through employee volunteerism. So I'd like to talk about a program that we developed with Eli Lilly and Company, one of our largest employers, with the goal that it could become a program available to any size business in our community. And it focuses around Fitnessgram. Now, you, many of you may be familiar with Fitnessgram. It's a, an assessment program now uh, embraced by the Presidential Youth Fitness Program, typically done in grades four through eight, four through high, four through high school in uh, schools. And it is an assessment program that measures a child's uh, in muscular strength, endurance, cardio, uh, and uh, uh, biometrics, height and weight. Typically given at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year. Uh, it's a wonderful resource in that it allows a PE educator to understand the fitness level of his or her class and base a curriculum accordingly for the kids. An individualized report goes home to the parents that indicates whether their son or daughter is in the healthy fitness zone and also in the healthy weight zone um, and provides some uh, information for how the parents can address some of those issues. Uh, and it also is a very efficient way to collect data for public health initiatives like ours. Now some of our schools were using Fitness Gram, but many were not and two barriers continued to come up. One, the cost, the licensing cost, about $500 or so per school for the initial licenses. And then secondly, the amount of time it takes to do the assessment. If you're a PE educator, you have 40 kids and you see them maybe three times a week and you have to run them through a series of five different assessments, it can take a long time to do that, several class periods. So we worked with Lilly to overcome both of those barriers. First, with a grant from the company's foundation and with a grant from Presidential Youth Physical Fitness, we've provided at no cost fitness gram licenses to all of the public schools in Indianapolis, about 200 schools. We also executed data share agreements with all of them um, so that the public health researchers can get the data that comes out of this. And then secondly, we created a volunteer program. And we modeled this 
partnering with Indianapolis Public Schools, our largest public school system, so that we could create a way for employees to be trained on the Fitness Grant Program and go in and do this. So, on October 2nd, 2014, as part of Lilly's Corporate Day of Service, 800 Lilly employees went to 53 IPS schools and did Fitness Gram assessments on 20,000 students, doing it about four hours what it would otherwise have taken the educators four weeks to do. And then what came out of that was a toolkit that we've now made available to all of the schools that allows schools to very easily bring volunteers in. Now it only takes eight to 12 volunteers to work in a school. So any size business can do this through an adopt the school program, um, can make a real impact in that specific way in their community. Here's the last thing I'll say in closing. One of the most important things that the business community can do as part of a health initiative like ours is to be uh, role models. And so we talk about great habits start with great role models. So when we kicked off our pledge campaign last fall, we asked members of our leadership council to sign uh, the pledge, and they all did. And so they have all agreed to be role models, not only within their company and for other businesses, but uh, within the broader community, and not only to be role models, but cheerleaders as well, and to help us roll this out. So quick overview of a lot of the things we're trying to accomplish with uh, this relatively new initiative in Indianapolis, and I really look forward to your feedback and uh, the conversation later out throughout the day.